Good evening. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's program on Emily Dickinson's music book. We welcome all of you who are here in the room and those of you who are out viewing on YouTube. We have a very robust audience in both places, so we're delighted that you're with us here this evening. We're coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Academic and Public Programs here, and again, we welcome you to um, this program this evening. I know that we have some folks here who are with us for the first time, so I'm going to say a few words about the AAS, and then we'll get right to the program. The American Antiquarian Society is a national research library. Um, with Thank you. AAS is a national, is that better? National Research Library with the mission to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past grounded in our growing collection of primary sources. The Society fosters a broad community of inquiry through inclusive programs and generous support of scholarship. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world and indeed from right here in Worcester to use our collections, both physical and digital, we host programs like this one that provide insights into the past and its resonance for our own day. You can learn more about AAS and our programs and our collections on our website, which is at AmericanAntiquarian.org. Tonight's program is being recorded, so just know that you can watch this program, if, again, if you like, and all of our programs on our YouTube channel. As a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide, and we thank you for that. Tonight's program is special in that it includes performance, performance in addition to the fruits of research. Using Emily Dickinson's letters and poems alongside sheet music, newspapers, and other archival sources from the American Antiquarian Society to explore various composers, arrangers and publishers beyond, behind the music, George Boswick presents new insights into the multiple layers of meaning that held, music, held meaning for Dickinson. George will present about his recent book, Emily Dickinson's Music Book and the Musical Life of an American Poet, which was published by the University of Massachusetts Press in 2022. And during the program, you will hear some 19th century parlor, parlor songs from Dickinson's music book. It will be performed by pianist Kit Young and soprano Maria Ferrante. And for those of you who are here with us in the room, we have some examples of cheap music and other pieces from our collections that George used during his research. So be sure to take, take some time afterwards to take a look at those. Um, and do know that we will have time for your questions at the end of tonight's program. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters this evening. Um, you can find full bios for them on our website under the listings for this program. So, program, so I'm just going to use some uh, brief, brief bios so that we can get right to the program. George Boswick is a musicologist, music librarian, composer, and performer. His 31 years with the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts included 11 years as Chief of the Music Division. As a composer, his Magnificat is published by C.F. Peters, and his music has been recorded on the Opus One as well as other labels. George Boswick and Trudy Williams, who is a former um, Creative Artists Fellow here at a and is with us here this evening in the front row, uh, co-founded the Red Skies Music Ensemble. Since 2012, they have co-authored and co-produced seven performance programs on various aspects of Emily Dickinson and her music and music. George currently serves on the board of the Emily Dickinson International Society. Kit Young is a pianist, improviser, and composer. Her chamber opera, What Miss Dickinson Heard and Didn't, explores improvisational music interpretations on a fixed libretto of Dickinson's poetry and letters. In 2022, she recorded repertoire on 19th century square pianos for George Boswick's uh, recently published book that he will be speaking about tonight. And since 1988, Miss Young's collaborations with musicians from Thailand, Myanmar, and China integrate her study and performance of both traditional and new music idioms. Soprano Maria Ferrante has become familiar to audiences world over in recital, oratorio, and in over 15 leading operatic roles. 
Maria's performances have delighted audiences from New York to the Virgin Islands, Prague, Japan, and London. And we're fortunate that she lives right here in Worcester. A winner of the Mario Lanza Voice Competition, she has been acclaimed by the Washington Post and the Boston Phoenix. Ms. Frade has recorded her for Nax Naxos, Albany, and AFKA labels, and also has four solo CDs to her credit. Please welcome George Bozowick to get us started for this evening's program. Thank you, Nan. Thank you to uh, Nan and the uh, American Antiquarian Society for inviting me. Thank you to the staff for this beautiful setup. It's really great. Before we begin, <clears throat> I'd like to echo Nan's acknowledgement of Trudy Williams. Uh, the programs on Dickinson that Trudy and I did, um, the research for those programs truly laid the basis for the book that you're going to be hearing about tonight. Um, I'd like also to have Kit Young, our pianist, talk to you about some of the magic that's going to be created in her piano to sound like uh, Dickinson's piano from the 1840s. So, Kit. Thank you, George. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so what you see in front of you is a keyboard which is known in, in the performing world as just a MIDI keyboard. What you'll hear is an 1858 Steinway Square piano um, that has been not sampled as many you know, instrumental sounds are, but um, this acoustic phenomenon of, of using algorithms to match a, a real piano and acoustic pianos, um, overtones and harmonic series. It's, um, so I'm saying this because it will sound different. And then now you know that the difference is in an app that's on a computer right nearby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So Emily Dickinson's love of home is memorialized in the music that she collected. As a young woman, Dickinson was an ambitious student of voice and piano. She attended concerts with her family and acquired a large amount of published sheet music to practice and perform at home. At the conclusion of those years of study, the music that Dickinson collected was bound into a keepsake book. In Dickinson's day, these volumes of bound sheet music were ubiquitous, assembled primarily by women during their formative years of musical training, the conclusion of which often coincided with adulthood or marriage. It's no coincidence, then, that the Dickinson music book was organized and bound around the time that her poems began to take shape. The Dickinson Parlor in Amherst, Massachusetts was a nexus of lively musical activity in which all of the family members participated as active performers and listeners, purchasers, and collectors of sheet music. So the Dickinson home was very important. So we'd like to begin with a performance of Home Sweet Home. Thank you. 
There truly is no place like home, especially since the Emily Dickinson Museum has now acquired the same 1851 Hallett and Davis piano that Dickinson enjoyed that you can see in the Dickinson room at Harvard. And Kit has played that piano last summer when I gave a talk there. And uh, it's really, really magnificent. So getting back to Dickinson's bound volume of sheet music, it's really big. It's really, really big. In comparison to other bound volumes, which are usually about, oh, maybe 30 or 40 pieces, there's 107 pieces of music in Dickinson's bound music volume, which is in the Houghton Library at Harvard. And it's been digitized, so you can look at it at home. It's really quite wonderful. Exploring the 107 pieces in Dickinson's bound music volume provides the framework for my book, the stories behind the music, the composers who created these pieces, and Dickinson's encounters with the famous touring groups that performed this music animate the trends and events in the cultural and political life of the young republic affecting the Dickinson family and Emily herself. It seems pretty likely that Emily acquired a substantial amount of the sheet music that's in her book uh, on two trips to Boston in 1844 and 1846 uh, when she was 13 and 15 years old. In later years, music was also sent home through Emily's brother Austin when he was teaching in Boston and later attending Harvard Law School. The front of Dickinson's music book contains a handwritten title indexed. The index features two hand-drawn images. While we don't know who made the index, who drew these images, or can we identify their subjects, it's pretty clear that the shepherd image was likely sourced from a popular piece of sheet music, The Lament of the Alpine Shepherd Boy, which was published in 1844. Dickinson has grouped her music in her bound volume into eight categories. Duet, variations, marches, quick steps, and waltzes, followed by two unnamed groupings. The first contain a quadrille and three polkas. The second is a selection of traditional vernacular music, what we also refer to as traditional fiddle tunes. The final category of songs includes 17 pieces of vocal music, followed by three popular minstrel tunes. The organization of her bound music book reflects the progress of Dickinson's musical studies, as well as her evolving musical taste. Upon opening the volume, a casual viewer immediately takes in the more difficult music, a four-hand opera overture and 13 variation sets on opera, other, on opera arias and other melodies. The back of the book, the last two groupings of vernacular music and songs can be viewed as a single aggregate of easier pieces from her earlier years of study. These include the tunes, as she referred to them, which were advertised by the music publishers as dances, hornpipes, and easy lessons. So there's no exaggeration when Emily writes to her friend by a root and says, Aunt Selby shan't let me have any more tunes for a while until I can get over in the Bertini method book a good ways first. So she, I assume she's talking about these fiddle tunes. In between the front and the back, the nine marches, 12 quick steps, and 32 waltzes serve as an intermediate bridge between the two groupings of easier music and more challenging music. The newer dance forms, the polka and quadrille, are positioned directly after the waltzes, reflecting a musical chronology and an enthusiasm for the newer forms that was supplanting the once popular waltzes of the day. The organization of the music book's content gives a distinctive arc to Emily Dickinson's musical studies. It's recently come to light that Emily Dickinson began her piano lessons at age eight. During 1839 and 1840, Dickinson studied piano for one year at the home of 16-year-old Anne Eliza Houghton of Amherst. After that year of study, Emily Dickinson entered the Amherst Academy 
and Dickinson's involvement with music seems to have progressed uninterrupted during her early years as instrumental music continued to be part of the Academy's curriculum. Dickinson's first mention of music she owned and played, as documented in her correspondence, was in 1845, when, when she was 14 years old. She would continue to acquire sheet music for at least another six or seven years until her music was bound. Dickinson scholar Christian Miller notes that Emily Dickinson was vitally engaged with multiple aspects of her culture, literary, social, religious, and political. There is every reason to think that the bound music in her volume certainly flex, reflects a similar engagement. Something that really surprised me about Dickinson's music book uh, was that it's a absolute treasure trove of information regarding the musical activities and public performance culture that was thriving in Dickinson's day, not only in the female and co-educational seminaries, but also through the formation of instrumental or choral societies and academies in the major cities and towns. The music that these composer teachers created for these seminaries and academies was recognized by the major music publishers. This music intersected with Emily Dickinson, and she acquired it. Here we have a copy of the Home Quick Step, which was composed by William Smith in 1836, a graduate of the Amenia Seminary in Amenia, New York, which is right by the Connecticut border. Beautiful, beautiful town. It was a co-educational boarding and day school. And his piece here is dedicated to seminary trustee, Dr. Luke W. Stanton. Smith's quick step found a home in many bound music volumes. The Syracuse Polka was a widely published popular piece that reveals the reputational glow attached to the prolific, its prolific composer, Jonathan Fowler, who was a prof professor of music at the Cherry Valley Female Academy in Cherry Valley, New York. According to the school's catalog, Fowler had few equals as a teacher. He wrote a great deal of music for his students, including the Syracuse Polka, which is dedicated to Miss R. H. Loomis of Syracuse, New York. Dickinson's music book contains a widely published set of variations on the traditional tune, Speed the Plow. 
You wouldn't know that the composer of this variation set in Dickinson's music book was George Dutton without consulting other editions of the same music brought out by Dutton's publisher, William Hall and Son. This edition from the collections of the American Antiquarian Society contains the same music, newly engraved with a title cover that identifies the composer of George as George Dutton. George Dutton of Utica, New York, is represented by two pieces in Dickinson's music book. Dutton was the proprietor of Utica's first music store and served as conductor of the orchestra of the short-lived Utica Musical Academy, which was founded in 1840 for the promotion of skill and taste in both sacred and secular music. Utica, New York had a vibrant, thriving cultural community and the Musical Academy and the Utica Female Academy were signifiers of that prosperity, status, and growth. Commemorated by the music in her music book, Emily's future sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert Dickinson, uh, grew up in Geneva, New York. And it's a pretty good bet and she went to the Utica Female Academy, and it's a pretty good bet that probably about nine of the New York State-themed pieces of music in her music book were given to Emily by Susan, although we don't know for sure. Dutton's piece is one of 13 variation sets that Emily collected. Her penchant for collecting these variation sets speaks loudly in articulating the European influence on America's changing musical taste from simple ballads to more complex music. These variation sets were featured on public exhibition programs at the seminaries and academies, including Mount Holyoke, which Dickinson attended. Her interest in this more challenging music clearly showcases her own increasing musical maturity. Here is the theme and first variation from Speed the Plow by George Dutton. During the 1840s and 50s, America's musical life outside the home was taking on a new shape. Moving beyond the traditional singing schools and sacred music of the meeting houses, big and small cities and some larger towns were witnessing the formation of an active musical culture of public performances by local bands, singing groups and professional touring ensembles, and soloists from abroad. This activity was supported by a burgeoning middle class of eager consumers of concert goers and sheet music collectors, including the Dickinsons. Emily Dickinson and her siblings heard some of these performers and their music filtered down into Emily's music book. The Dickinsons witnessed the Swedish soprano Jenny Lind at a concert in Northampton in 1851. Herself, and not her music was what we seem to love, wrote Dickinson, whose early poems from around this time may have had something to say about Jenny Lind as well. Yeah, she really kind of slammed Jenny Lind, especially uh, Home Sweet Home. That's another reason why I wanted to, to uh, show that to you. She was really used to uh, the Irish servants around her home, hearing some of these Irish ballads and, and singing in an nice Irish accent. Lind 
had a penchant for transposing her pieces maybe a third higher so that they would sparkle at the same time. But as a consequence, they weren't these beautiful dark hues that Emily was used to, particularly when Lynn would sing Irish ballads. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Emily attended a performance of the magnificent Germania Serenade Band at the Amherst College commencement in 1853. Emily wrote to her brother, I never heard sounds before. They seemed like brazen robins, all wearing broadcloth wings, and I think they were, because they all flew away when the concert was over. Now, I just want to say something here. Emily says, I never heard sounds before. There's a new set of Dickinson letters um, by um, uh, Chris Miller coming out next year, Harvard University Press. Johnson, in, in 1955, put in a little bracket in there. And, and Emily says, I never heard such sounds before. Well, it's not such sounds. It's the sounds that she never heard before. Not only did this group wow audiences, Emily, as she does in that Dickinson show, what was going on up here at the same time that she was hearing the sounds of the Germanian, she was beginning to hear other sounds in her head about her poems. Years later, Emily would memorialize this concert in her poem Musicians wrestle everywhere, transforming the Germanians from brazen robins into a band in brass and scarlet dressed. The Germanians arrived in the US in 1848 for an extended stay, and they wowed audiences with music of Beethoven, whose music was still new to US audiences and new to Emily Dickinson. So her response to the Germanians was pretty typical when she said, I never heard sounds before. One of the pieces performed by the Germanians that Dickinson collected and referenced in her correspondence was the waltz set, Sounds from Home. Sounds from Home was composed by the Hungarian orchestra leader, Josef Gungel. Sounds from Home took the United States by storm, stimulating the sales of sheet music. Dickinson was obviously taken with this music as well. And years later, in writing to her cousins, in writing to her cousin, Louisa Norcross, who was about to embark on a visit to Dickinson's cousin, Eliza Coleman, in Middletown, Connecticut, Dickinson enthused to her cousin, I am glad to the foot of my heart that you will go to Middletown. It will make you warm. Touches from home, tell Gungle, are better than sounds.
music books content, and Emily Dickinson's correspondence provide insight into the Dickinson family personalities. The presence in Dickinson's music book of Roderick Dew's March, or Hail to the Chief as we know it, provides good theme music to commence a musical nod to Emily's father, Edward Dickinson, Amherst's chief citizen. There's three things that inspired and engaged Edward Dickinson. The militia, the opening of the Amherst Railroad, and Whig Party politics. All of these find representation in his daughter Emily's music book. Edward Dickinson actively participated in the Massachusetts militia until at least into the mid-1840s, and the majority of the militia-related music in Emily's Bound music book can be dated to this period. This music offers up reminders of pleasant experiences, which Edward passed down to his daughter in the form of sheet music for her to perform at home. Now, we don't know that he actually got her the sheet music, but it's pretty obvious that there's so much military music in this book uh, that he was surely a part of that uh, he gave it to her. Emily often played the piano for her father whenever he requested it. He sometimes used music to impose a sense of orderliness in the Dickinson home, especially if his daughters had been out and about in the evening. Edward's sense of discipline sometimes amused Emily. She wrote often, both ruefully and admiringly, of her father, with his stentorian tone and patrician demeanor. Emily once wrote to her cousins, Father steps like Cromwell when he gets the kindlings. Another interest of Edward Dickinson was the railroad. The locomotive quick step in Emily Dickinson's music book reminds us that Edward Dickinson was instrumental in bringing the railroad to Amherst, so much so that in 1862, one of the locomotives was thoroughly renovated and rechristened the Edward Dickinson. Now, one of my tasks in writing this book was to thoroughly understand and communicate each of the 107 pieces in Dickinson's book. And the way I did that was through two online bibliographies that accompany this book. The first one covers all 107 pieces that are in the book. The second one covers all of the uh, known quotations from the family correspondence where they cite uh, titles of pieces or words from songs and things like that. So one of the ways to go about this business is to uh, look at uh, publishers' plate numbers. Now, publishers used plate numbers as a kind of a loose inventory of the music that they would publish. Let's say plate numbers 1 to 100 we, have, we know by examining enough music that plate numbers 1 to 100 of a particular publisher's output may have occurred in 1844. So then if you suddenly see something 110 
Maybe, well, maybe that was the next year. You know, but you don't really know. And um, in this particular instance, uh, the, the plate number seems to reflect a publication date of 1844, uh, but there was uh, advertising going on in newspapers before that time. Um, this Dickinson broad, this uh, broadside from uh, Oliver Dixon also cites this locomotive quick set from 1844. Um, so again, you know, there's a plate number on there that seems to suggest that it was published in 1845, but the advertising in the paper and the fact that this piece appeared for sale in an 1844 broadside tells you a different story. And this, you can see in the back. Wow, well, when I went to request it, some of the staff came out and said, oh, I want to see this, I want to see this, because it's so big, you know? It's huge, and it's a, just a wonderful uh, resource. So I'm going to get even a little more wonky for just a minute and tell you that uh, additional evidence as to the 1844 year of publication of this particular piece can be observed in two states issued by Oliver Ditson. The first state, this one here, contains the imprint of 135 Washington Street, an address Ditson occupied from 1842 to 1844. A second state shows that Dickinson's title engraver restruck the plate to read 115 Washington Street after Ditson moved to that address sometime in 1844. And now, here is the locomotive quick step from Emily Dickinson's music book. We see Emily Dickinson and her sister Lavinia, also known as Vinnie. Emily's wit and humor enlivened the setting of the family parlor and home music making and the Dickinson family personalities. The musical dynamic between Emily and her sister Lavinia enhances our perspective on the two sisters who engaged with music in very different ways. Emily enjoyed the more introspective side of instrumental music and collected a great deal of it. A good deal of this instrumental music, especially as I showed you in the front part of the book, uh, required above average technique, something we can observe in the dynamic between the two sisters. On December 15th, 1851, Emily wrote to her brother, thank you for the music, Austin, and thank you for the books. I shall learn my part of the duet and try to have Vinnie hers. Emily did try to enlist Lavinia in performing a four-hand piano duet. This is um, an uh, opera overture from uh, Lodoiska by uh, Kreutzer. So she tried, but about six weeks later, she wrote to her brother and said, Vinny cannot learn it. Lavinia's musical preferences were consistently aimed at sentimental vocal ballads, so much so that Lavinia was constantly hounding her brother Austin to send her pieces associated with the latest vocal stars. 
Now, before I go on with this, I'm not really dissing Lavinia because if it wasn't for Lavinia, we wouldn't know half the music that the Dickinsons performed in their parlor because she wrote about it all the time. Emily was concerned with other things, and she also wrote about music, but not nearly as much as uh, her sister Lavinia. So here's one of those classic letters. On January 26, 1852, Lavinia wrote to her brother, Dear Austin, the song Merry Days When We Were Young is not the one I sent for, and I want you to have you exchange it, if you will. The one I want you to get is sung by Mrs. Wood and not by Mr. Leffler. I do not want this one anyhow. I think you can find the right one at some of the music stores. I am anxious to have it. Olivia Coleman used to sing it, and tis a beautiful thing. Remember that tis sung by Mrs. Wood and no other. The tune begins with these words. Oh, the merry days, the merry days when we were young. What Lavinia received from Austin was a completely different song by the same title, written by the English composer Edward James Loder, a song that was associated with the English bass baritone Adam Leffler, who accompanied Mrs. Wood to the US, making his debut in 1840. We are really fortunate in that there is a copy of the version of the song as sung by Mr. Leffler here in the American Antiquarian Society, and we are pleased to share that with you now. About two weeks later, the correct song shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Lavinia wrote to her brother, the music is all right, and I thank you very much for it. I have learned most of it. 
celebrated superstars Mary Ann Patton Wood and her husband Joseph made their United States debut in 1833, performing in concerts and operas at the major theaters on the East Coast and the Midwest. The Woods returned to the United States twice more. Their last visit was in 1840, coincided with the publication of Oh, the Merry Days When We Were Young, which was popularized by Mrs. Wood. So you see, Leffler came with them during their last visit in 1840. So that's why you have the two 1840 versions of Oh, the Merry Days When We Were Young, because the publisher wanted to capitalize not only on the Woods, but the guy who was kind of trailing in their wake, who was equally great, um, Adam Leffler. So this song, the Mrs. Wood song, is, is certainly a poignant song, typical of the expressions of sentimentality, which were so common in Dickinson's day. Lavinia, in her letter, mentions Olivia Coleman, a childhood friend who died of tuberculosis in 1847. Olivia Coleman was 20 years old. Emily, too, favored some of these sentimental ballads. They're in her music book. Dickinson scholar Christian Miller tells us that while there is ample evidence that Dickinson wrote with poems with the rhythms of hymns in her ears, several aspects of her verse suggest that a more accurate formulation would be that she wrote in relation to song. Song in this context includes the hymns and ballads she sang, the poetry she read, and the popular music she played on the piano. Miller's observations are well illustrated in Dickinson's poem, Blossoms Will Run Away. Here, Dickinson reminds us that memory, like melody, is pink eternally. This sentiment of an active and sustained memory finds expression in a music book in Henry Russell's enormously popular ballad, The Old Armchair. Russell's melody for the old armchair was set to a poem by Eliza Cook, which addresses the lasting memory of motherhood and the role of mother, whose person and position in the home is the most revered. The intense expression of sentiment common to these period vocal pieces is emphatically represented here.
When she was in her 20s, Emily Dickinson was known by family and neighbors to be an expert improviser at the keyboard, an activity that was witnessed and reported by her family, friends, and neighbors. Now, as part of her music lessons, I'm sure that she was taught um, to improvise to a certain extent. Kit just gave a paper at the Emily Dickinson International Society Conference on the technique of preluding, warming up scales, you know, when you sat down at the piano. And then after that warm up, you might improvise something. Might not be in a style or something from your lessons. Um, but Emily, she was a little different about it, I guess. When before seating herself at the piano, she would cover the upper and lower octaves of the instrument so that it would correspond to the smaller square pianos that she had when she was a child and she learned to play. And we don't know exactly what these improvisations sounded like. Dickinson's niece tells us that Emily improvised brilliantly upon the piano all sorts of dramatic performances of her own, one she called the devil, being particularly applauded. Perhaps the smaller range you know, the keyboard, smaller keyboard, invites comparison to some of the traditional tunes in her music book. These Scotch-Irish and American fiddle tunes were part of a body of music that Emily would have easily absorbed, both through her lessons and across the threshold of the kitchen as her daily chores, particularly her bread-making duties, intersected with the lives, the sounds, and the music of the Dickinson servants. Charles Thompson, a laborer for the Dickinsons, and for Amherst College, he played the fiddle 
and taught some of the local children to play. Perhaps one of the tunes he taught them was Drops of Brandy. We know that he taught them Money Musk, so it's an equally well-known tune. And for a long time in the 19th century and beyond, New England was really the epicenter for traditional music making. So in that sense, Thompson and Dickinson and the music in her music book would have been intimately acquainted. So let's listen to Drops of Brandy. Anecdotes, backstories, and connections behind the music that Dickinson enjoyed, played, and collected are many. And there's much more still to be observed, studied, and discovered about the music book that will reveal for us an even fuller picture about the musical life of our a great American poet, Emily Dickinson. We'd like to end our program with one more selection from Emily Dickinson's music book, the beautiful Irish ballad, Believe me if all those endearing young charms. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, as promised, we have some time for your questions. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand. I will bring the microphone to you, and we will also see if there are questions coming in on YouTube. Yes? Have you any these vocal pieces? I got a, a, not being a musicologist, can you say anything where they came from musically and where they went? Like. Who, what, is there anything that Schubert picked up from some of these, or did they come from any le leader type of tradition, or whatever, you know? No, this is, uh, Schubert hadn't arrived yet. He hadn't made it into town, and wouldn't do so for a while. Uh, these were art songs composed by uh, the composers of the day. Uh, Russell, Henry Russell, for instance, uh, was from England, but he made his name in the US 
and his music was enormously popular, uh, so much so that the British publishers were scrambling to, they were practically stealing American editions and, and reprinting them as English editions. But really, to your point, um, there are nine waltzes in Emily's music book misattributed to Beethoven because he was just beginning to be uh, popularized in the US. Beethoven died in 1827. We all know that. Uh, what you may not know is that the first performances of Beethoven's symphonies in New York didn't occur to 1841. That's a really long time for the music to get over here. Then you have to find the musicians who are talented enough to play it. And you've got to get them together in orchestras that are cohesive uh, and big enough to recreate this demanding music. And then in 1842, with the formation of the New York Philharmonic or the Philharmonic Society, which is now the New York Philharmonic, you didn't have any of these full-time orchestras who could just take this stuff on. And it was the business of the players in those orchestras to play this kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's a little hard to comprehend, but that was it. It just took a while for Beethoven and Mozart and Mendelssohn and Schubert and all those guys to uh, get over here and be performed regularly. You know, not just a little bit here and a little bit there by groups who could do it. And so that's a good reason why you don't see uh, that kind of music in Dickinson's music book. It was just too early, the 1840s. I think the last piece in her music book is from about 1851, you know. And by the early 1850s, Emily was pretty busy with her poetry. You know, it was really just happening right around the time the music book was bound. Um, and another thing you may be curious about, you know, Lavinia is asking for all this music. Where is it today? We don't know. We know Emily's music book is at Harvard. Um, she's got a couple of pieces at the Jones Library in Amherst that she uh, talked about. But all that music that Lavinia requested, it's not in any of the Dickinson-related collections that I could find. Nor did we ever come across um, a bound volume belonging to Lavinia. I shudder to think that it might have been you know, acquired by some institution and then cut up and made into sheet music. But I, I, that was the practice long ago. But uh, I just don't know. So there's a very long answer to that question. Any other questions? Thank you for this very interesting view into Emily. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you found any evidence in any of your research about whether her poetry, the musicality of her poetry, was influenced by her love of this kind of music. I mean, it was. I really was interested in particular in those per, those pointed lines that you picked out. Yeah. Um, but in general, was there anything that she was trying to, uh, you know, pick up the musicality of you know of what she loved so much in her poetry? Well, we, we do know that her poetry was underpinned by um, uh, hymns and popular ballads and uh, uh, that sort of thing. But yeah, there's been a good deal written on sound. Judy Jo Small, Positive as Sound, I don't know if you know that book. Um, she talks about the musical impulses in Dickinson's poetry. Uh, that certainly would have come from the music that she collected. Uh, so there's plenty, plenty in there to go on. What I was really interested in and what never had been done before was to look at Emily Dickinson. I think it hadn't been done before. Uh, was to look at Emily Dickinson from a musical point of view, as a musician, as a musicologist, not as a poet. The poetry for me came in chapter 10, you know? And before that, it was all about the long process of Emily and her music, you know. So that, that was my point of view. But certainly, Judy Jo Small's book uh, comes immediately to mind. It's called Positive as Sound. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, part of your research is today. Ask Emily, Emily Dickinson a question to solve some of your questions, what would that question be? 
Well, I think the big question is, all right, what, so what did these improvisations sound like, and what was so great about the devil? You know? <laughs> Anyone else? That few, thank you for that. That's a good one. Anyone else? Well, I mean, if you st how, how many of you have seen the Apple TV series Dickinson? Okay, I think you should see it. You should watch it, and you should say, I love it, I love it, or else I don't like this. You know, that's the take on it. And there's plenty of rap music in there. And there's plenty of contemporary speech. There's plenty of modern speech. And it's a real, you know what I love most about the Emily Dickinson scholars? They take in people like me, <laughs> who was an interloper. I'm not anymore, but you know I was in the beginning. And they, they embraced what I was doing. And these Dickinson scholars pretty much embrace you know, anything that you want to interpret with Dickinson. You know, some of them worked with um, uh, the people who did the Dickinson uh, Apple TV show. So it's, there's so many ways to interpret uh, Dickinson, it's it's really cool. I, I think it's because her poetry is so musical that uh, I mean the last chapter in my book compares Emily Dickinson to Charles Ives. You know, I'd like to know what you think about that. You know, so there's just so much that you can uh, talk about with Dickinson and her poetry and her correspondence. Who knew that was she was such a hoot? You know, so any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. I just want to let you know about some two upcoming programs. Our next program, public program, will be on September 7th, which is um, a hybrid program. So you can be either here or on YouTube. Uh, it is John Wood Sweet, who will be talking about his recent book, um, a Sewing Girl's Tale, a story of crime and consequence in revolutionary America. So that will be great fun to, uh, to hear John talk about his book. And then on September 14th, a week after that, uh, we will have a, another hybrid program on Texas lithographs. This will be Ron Tyler talking about his recent book, um, Visual uh, History of Lithography in Texas. So that also will be really great fun, again, in person here and on YouTube. So thank you all for joining us. We're taking a bit of a break in August, but we'll be back with a robust set of programs starting in September. Thanks again. Thank you.